today I'm get to be uh, double duty. I'm the host, so I get to ask myself questions, and I get to keep the conversation flowing. And so that in order to do that properly, I wrote everything down so that uh, I don't get uh, distracted by uh, anything. And so I can, there is so much information on this that I have dug out over the last decade that uh, I feel it's very important to write it down so that it's accurate and I don't allude to anything that isn't there and that you have all the facts. And uh, the handout had the, has the story as I best can tell it uh, with facts from both sides of the border, which no other story has at this point. Uh, today's presentation is personal to me, and I didn't realize until I started uh, thinking about this that uh, I used to uh, visit Bert, uh, Jim Bell's, the, the man that was murdered, son in, down in Glendale for a couple of years, and he was in his 90s then. And so I know firsthand what he thought of at least his dad's funeral. And at age 92, he was still making his own shoes because the other people couldn't make them to fit him. So uh, he was quite a man. And I also remember my grandfather, who was 14 at the time, uh, describing what it was like to be in a home where one of the vigilantes left from and what they went through and the concerns they had, the fears they had. And so I know firsthand from talking to my grandfather, who was there, uh, about that. And the third aspect was when we moved into my great uncle's homestead, the woods had taken over. So we became like homesteaders again, pushing the woods back. And I know how frightening it was uh, to uh, a child. I was a pre tea when we moved there. I was nine. And uh, for four years, we didn't go outside after dark because there were bear roaming around between cherry time and hibernation time. And there were cougars were in the woods. I saw cougar tracks within 100 feet of the house. Uh, and uh, so I know, have a feeling for what it was like in 1884 when there was nobody anywhere near. You could shout, you could shoot off your gun, and you might, somebody might hear you, but that would be all. They wouldn't know anything else. All these things played uh, into my desire to put the record straight relative to Jim Bell's murder and the great fear it put into the settler's mind. There never would have been a lynching uh, if it uh, did not appear to the local settlers that Louis Sam had murdered a homesteader, Jim Bell. All published stories to date have centered on Louis Sam's death and uh, the intrusion of American justice onto British soil. The stories totally ignore the factual data presented by the American coroner's jury verdict related to Jim Bell's murder. These stories also ignore the fears the settlers had regarding the more hostile Chilliwack Indians. The fact that a travesty of justice occurred on British Canadian soil uh, that had never uh, happened before or since caused researchers to ignore some very important factual data. It is as if the American Jim Bell's life was insignificant, and a Canadian Indian boy who was considered bad by his own tribe was the only important life involved in these two murders, both of which were travesty of justice. My presentation is intended to cover all the important facts, both American and Canadian, by first telling the story as I believe it happened, then to state popular published opinions and often contrasting facts. Many of the facts that have been presented in the published stories have been accurate. It is the conclusions reached based upon incomplete collection of facts that are inaccurate, in my never-to-be-humble opinion. <laughs> First, I need to create the setting for the 1884 tuxedo, as I call it, because that was my great-grandfather's post office. And it was the only post office in the area, outside of the crossing. And the folks who had come to settle this very prim primitive frontier, I will refer to the Native American or First Nation people as Indians, as that's what they were called in 1884. The Nooksack Indians, which were the local tribe, were very friendly to the settlers and taught them many survival skills. In turn, the Indians' life improved with the arrival of white man's better medical and educational services. Prior to this time, there was only the medicine man to both educate and care for the health needs 
of the local tribes. History describes how whole tribes have been wiped out with plagues of various types. Slavery was accepted as normal, with, but the white settlers discouraged this practice. Revenge was also a norm that was discouraged by white settlers who preferred the American jury system, which has as its roots British jurisprudence. The food supply became more consistent as the Indian's life was built upon the salmon runs, which varied considerably. The settler's desire to farm increased the diet of everybody, as did the advent of dairy and beef cows. The local Indians were not known hunters, but rather depended on gathering. The dwellings of the Indians improved after they saw the settlers build safe, warm, and secure buildings. Log houses were first built by the settlers, and then frame constructed homes when the lumber mills uh, were built. The use of stoves instead of open fires was also an improvement brought in by the settlers. Store goods in quantity were first introduced to the crossing by William Moultrie when he built his store and hotel in 1876. Prior to, the, to that, Whatcom was the closest access to abundant store goods. The first boarding school was built at about the same time for the white settlers' children, and the largest school in the county was at the crossing. Some of the Indians sent their children to school, although their attendance was inconsistent. The settlers' children also did not all attend regularly either because farm chores had preference over school. An Indian boarding school was built at the crossing. It was originally to be built on this very site, but it was built on this, out on Washington. But it was later replaced by one on Stickney Island. And then later they built another one at the mission road, on the Mission Road. The homesteaders were primarily interested in land that was not occupied by Indians, so there was little conflict with land ownership as most of the Indians lived along the river. Jim Antone was one Indian who had an off-river homestead as he settled along the Breckenridge Creek. He often said that he wanted to live like the white man. However, my wife remembers his daughter Lucy as a classmate who died of tuberculosis while still a teenager. Most of Indian Antone's family died similar deaths because they did not have healthy living conditions. Dense woods surrounded all the settlers' humble abodes so that most people rarely saw anyone outside their immediate family. Uh, the only exceptions were when they went to store or to church. Uh, my parents or my grandparents never saw their son David except at church because he was homesteading. And he didn't have time to go out off the property. He had to uh, take and challenge his woods. There was very little time for social interaction when the homesteads needed to be proved up or they would lose their homestead land claims. The only method of travel was walking. And there were few horses in the area that, in 1884. There were few established trails, as you can see by this map. And you'll see... Uh, uh, down where where's my little there we are down here is Watcom see it right there and this trail goes straight to the crossing that isn't quite accurate this cartography needs to be improved but this was the first map and here's the, where Everson is and this is where the action took place right here and then the trail went up this way into Canada and that was little more than a uh, uh, dirt track through the middle of the woods. It was not in any way, shape, a trail, or a, like we would call a trail today, or a road. Most settlers had very primitive trails. Uh, often you couldn't even see the trail. It was so primitive. You know, they knew where it was, but often you couldn't see it. From the trails, this is the trail system in yellow. Are all, it's the only travel corridors in Watkins County in 1884. And uh, the Indians used them, and the white men adapted to them. And then they built their homesteads along those little trails and ran uh, side trails off to them, to their homesteads. This is, will become very important to the story when you consider what frightened the settlers in 1884. Uh, Jim Bell uh, was aged 53 when he came to the crossing. His dad was a Scot and his mother was a Canadian. And Annette, was, uh, her dad was a 
Prussian, and her mother was an Australian. And she was 25, and their little boy Jim was about four. And they got here in 1878 from San Francisco. They took a homestead on the Telegraph Trail just east of the crossing and had nearly completed proving up on it by 1884. They had established a good log home and cleared enough land to qualify. However, Annette was able to provide substantial income by teaching in New Westminster. School sessions were typically six months or less. So uh, Annette and young Jim were home at the crossing when school was not in session. Jim Sr. was locally known as a kindly old man. He was 59 in 84. So those of you who are older than 59, I don't know what they would have called you in those days. And he offered meals to travelers uh, on the Telegraph Road, which passed just south of their log cabin. Being two miles east of the crossing, he also had a limited supply of store goods to sell to the nearby settlers. His probate in 1884 indicates that he had very limited store goods. I'll read those in just a minute. Louis Sam lived with his brother and father on the Indian Reservation 6, which is now known as Kilgard. It's up north of the border, about five miles. They were not considered good tribal members and the father Massachi uh, Mean or Jack Sam was in prison in New Westminster suspected of killing Henry Melville. Both Louis and his brother were known thieves which is very unusual among the Indians. The Indians didn't weren't interested in stealing from each other uh, but the, these this family did and where they were known to like alcohol. They were called bad by their own Chilliwack tribe. The American settlers were very wary when Louis, with his treasured Hudson Bay musket, or his brother were in the vicinity. Some tell stories about how they were stolen from, and Louis was always suspect, having been caught during several attempts. The, um, with this background, I'm going to read the story. But first, I'm going to, are there any questions about what I've just read? And then I'll read the what uh, Jim Bell had in his cabin as personal property uh, after he died. Here's his personal property listing. Now you consider this is all of his personal property and the store goods. He had 11 pairs of white socks. He had 12 uh, 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 pairs of colored socks. He had 11 shakers. I'm not really sure what a shaker was. He had six pairs of children's uh, socks. He had two thermometers. He had 12 pairs of brown mixed hose. He had six pair of ladies' hose. He had 12 cotton uh, wonder, wonder shed. I didn't get that one. He had 12 uh, men's colored shirts. He had three pair of drawers. Two, five jumpers, uh, six pairs of boys' suspenders, four pairs of men's suspenders, uh, two hall cops, uh, three pairs of woolen mittens, uh, 12 handkerchiefs, 12 uh, claws, three cards of buttons, two blank books, three pairs of jeans, uh, pa uh, two pocket knives, one milk cow, one yearling bull, one grindstone, one hay fork, a garden rake, uh, a, a buck saw, an axe, and four cans of matches, and, and that was it. Now, that is a personal property as well as his store goods. Yes? He had no weapons No. Could you repeat the question when they say, because I can't Oh, excuse me. Uh, Kathy asked if he had any weapons, and he did not. Uh, so that was his personal property. I don't think he ever saw the need for it. He was a trusting soul. <laughs> Obviously, it didn't work out well for him. Okay. Now, we'll read your story. So we can switch to the other map there. This is called Jim Bell's Murder. 
which I feel should be the story of the whole thing because he's the only really innocent one involved. All the rest were not really in the right when they were did what they did. Okay, this is uh, this is the map of the events. So you uh, that have your copies can read along. The story begins with the sighting of for a 14-year-old Chilliwack Indian boy named Louis Sam headed west along the Telegraph Trail alone except for his treasured Hudson Bay musket on his shoulder. You have to remember some of these uh, information like him being alone are very important because later on you're going to find the other story said he was riding with a man on a horse or he was a, in the company of a man on a horse. So he was alone for his treasure at Hudson Bay. This time of the, the time was Sunday afternoon, February 24th, 1884, about 1 p.m., when he was seen by Mr. and Mrs. Breckenridge, which is number 15 on your, uh, where is my, I can't see my little light here. There it is. 15 is down right in here. Let's look at this map. It's up on, it's up by the cemetery, right in here. And. Yeah, they, this is a trail up here, and uh, Breckenridge List cited him here, and William Perry cited him up here, and uh, he was headed down west, well, actually southwesterly here. That's the first time he was spotted. Did you point out Everson? Everson is uh, right in this area. This is the crossing over here. Everson was on this side of the bend. Okay, remember the trail was little more than an opening in the forest which people and animals kept open by frequent travel. So sight distance was very limited. The next known incident was number nine on your map, which is uh, right here. This is Bell's cabin right here on the trail. Nooksack is right here. This is Nooksack now. So it was nine, nine on your map, and that was when Jim came out of his cabin between 1 and 2 p.m., so shortly after uh, uh, Louis was sighted up on the trail. And he hailed William Osterman, who was headed west on the trail but was on horseback. Keep in mind that Mr. Osterman was a telegraph operator and was frequently surveying the telegraph line on horseback. The telegraph wire ran up the trail and was attached to trees with insulators. Falling branches frequently brought the line down and hindered telegraph communication, so frequent vigilance was necessary by Mr. Osterman. Jim Bell had a letter that he wanted posted, and so he hailed Osterman, and Osterman was headed for the crossing and could take it to the post office and say, Jim, a walk of four miles, two miles each way. Osterman later reported that he heard loud noises coming from the cabin and had stopped to see what they were. So it is likely that Osterman was sitting on his horse listening when Bell noticed him. Osterman then left with the letter to return home and post Bell's letter. The next known incident, sometime in mid-afternoon, is when the three Gillies boys, return, returning from the crossing, noticed the cabin on fire as they passed it on their way home. And the Gillies lived up in this area, and the uh, Bell's here. And they were coming back from, uh, coming up the trail this way, going back home. You see, there's no trail between here and their home. And they passed Bell right here and noticed that the cabin was on fire. And they found Bell lying on his back, and they considered him dead because of the large hole in his head. So they dragged him out of the burning house to a safe place and went to tell others the cabin was on fire. It should be noted that Jim Bell's, was still, Bell's body was still warm when they moved it. Forest fires were always a concern in this wooded setting, even in winter. A forest fire just a year later burned out most of the Linden settlers. So it is reasonable that they would leave Jim's body to get help in fighting the fire before it set the woods on fire. The group of men quickly assembled and with buckets they were able to put the fire out with water from nearby Pritz Slough. Uh, Pritz Slough just, you know, it's up here on this map. Pritz Slough is up in here, and it's just, just north of Bell's Cabin. 
After the fire was out, they started to examine the area and found a set of footprints leading to the slough. They could have noticed them while they were making the water bucket runs, as there had been a snow the day before, and it was now melted, so the ground was soft and would have made easily seen footprints. Some type of impression was made, as a posse later noted that Louis Sam's boot fit the footprint perfectly. A group of men followed the trail of footprints. They led to the slough and to a downed tree which extended some distance into the slough. The footprints went down the tree into the slough. Then the person making the footprints jumped off the end of the uh, log and into the swamp and headed west through the heavy brush. A new clean handkerchief and a pair of new suspenders were left hanging from the thick underbrush. This is told in more detail by an eyewitness, George Gillis, when he was interviewed by P.R. Jeffcott and is recorded in Jeffcott's Nooksack Tales and Trails, which Eileen told you was in the library here. The next report cited of Lewing Sam was on the trail to Linden. Now we're, we're, uh, where's that little light? There it is. Here's the bell cabin. The slough was up here. So he went north into the slough and then over here and then he was headed west through this area here. The next sighting was on the Linden Trail over in here. Uh, Pete Harkness was coming back from Linden to his home which was right in this area, oh, it's this area. But, uh, and, he, and Louis was headed west, on, northwest on the trail when they met. Uh, Pete Harkness was a 15-year-old boy. He was coming home from Linden when he spotted Louis headed toward him with a very mean look in his eye so that Pete got as far to the side of the trail as he could give, to give Louis all the room he could. Keep in mind that the nature of the trail, it would have been difficult for Pete to have been more than 10 feet away from Louis when they passed. So the demeanor would have been e very easy for Pete to see. Louis still had his treasure Hudson Bay musket on his shoulder. Chief Jim, number 18, which is right over here, in Stickney Island, which is right there, uh, Chief Jim later reported that Louis came to his village on Stickney Island to stay the night and appeared to be quite agitated. Some time later, Chief Jim heard that a posse was headed, uh, was looking for the murderer and would be headed for Linden in the morning. So he told Louis that he'd be safer if he were in Canada. Sometime during the night, Louis left. His brother and he were spotted at Barnes Prairie later that night by Bob Johnson, who lived there. And Barnes Prairie is up here. We now know it as Clearbrook. So uh, they somehow he linked up with his brother and got up there. On Monday the 25th, Coroner Manley went to the crossing to examine Jim Bell's body. He took Sheriff Lakey with him as it appeared to be murder. Sheriff Lecky then took command of the posse and they went west to Indian Jim's place where they determined that Louis had returned to Canada. Coroner Manley, Manley impaneled a coroner's jury, but unfortunately the notes from that jury event have not been preserved. On Tuesday the 26th, the jury returned a verdict. The summary of that report is, was quoted verbatim in the Reveille on February 29, the Reveille being the big paper in Bellingham at the time, or Whatcom, Bellingham didn't exist, and has been quoted many times. The jury verdict read in part, death was caused by a bullet passing through his head, supposed to be by the hand of an Indian by the name of Jack Sam. Minishi was Chinookan for mean, and both Louie and his dad Jim were called Minishi or Jack Sam. Sheriff Lucky asked Robert Breckenridge, remember he's the guy that first saw Louis, uh, Bell's neighbor up on the hill to sign a complaint for the arrest of Louis Sam for the murder of Jim Bell, which he did. And the next day, Wednesday the 27th, Breckenridge rode with Sheriff up to Canada. They asked Constable William Campbell to arrest Louis on the basis of their complaint. Campbell issued an arrest warrant and Breckenridge left to attend Jim Bell's funeral. Constable William Campbell and Sheriff Lecky went to the Sam home on Kilgard and arrested Louis for the murder of Jim Bell. 
Louis offered no resistance, and Campbell put him in handcuffs before he reached, searched Louis's home. Louis was the only one home, and there were several new items that appeared to have been stolen from Bell's, quote, store, including Mr. Bell's jackknife, but no cash or gold were noted. That's important because that's been reported that that was the reason for the uh, robbery. Sheriff Lecky requested that he take Louis back to Watcom to stand trial, but Campbell would not consent, saying the Dominion had first rights and that Lecky could extradite him later. Keep in mind it was on the basis of the American complaint that Louis was arrested in the first place, as the Canadians had no other reason to arrest or try him. So Sheriff Lecky returned to Watcom without his prisoner. On his way home, he met the, a group of men, some on horses, and many walking, and said to them, How do you do, boys? You'll find him up there all right. But it was dark, or nearly dark by then, so it is doubtful he recognized any of the men. Campbell took Louis to York's place to hold him for the night, so that he could be taken to New Westminster by the next day. Why don't we put that next map up, so I can point out some of these. This is Kilgard. That's where Louis, li Louis Sam lived. This is York's place, and Campbell was lived right over here. They, li they were just uh, less than a mile apart, and uh, this is where the uh, lynching took place. So they, they walked up the trail, they got Campbell, they went up to Kilgard, arrested the guy, and they brought him back to York's place. And, uh, okay, now. so uh, Campbell took Louis to York's place to hold him for the night so he could be taken to the newest minister the next day, which meant, which was the nearest jail. York's hotel was the only public building in the vicinity, and it was a long day's ride to New Westminster, so they had to hold him overnight. Campbell deputized York and Mr. Steele. Steele was York's nearest neighbor, but was an American homesteader who may have been visiting for the day. There is substantial evidence as to the happenings at the York Hotel that night gleaned from the coroner's inquest and many eyewitnesses. All of the documents have been well preserved in Victoria and I have reviewed them all thanks to the footnotes in Dr. Carlson's very well documented report written in 1996. Summarize it to say that someone opened the door to the disguised men who rode up after dark and the vigilantes took control of the prisoner and left York's place with Louis Sam, whom they placed on a horse. Yes, so the next stat is interesting. Mr. York testified that it happened after 9 p.m. because that's when they went to bed. Mrs. York said it happened at 8.15. 8 so Mr. and Mrs. York did not agree about when this actually took place. The funeral was held at Bell's neighbor's home, uh, this, that's back on the other map, uh, which was just uh, less than a mile north of his. And the freshly made casket, maybe it was the first made in the crossing, I don't know, was hauled up the hill along the trail for burial where the Nooksack Cemetery is now located. Jim's 10-year-old son remembers riding on the lid to keep it from flying off. <laughs> so. Uh, it was after the burial that the men got into a heated de debate and the vigilante group was formed. The men were very concerned about another Indian uprising. The next incident appears to be best documented by the confessions, some 60 years later, of three eyewitnesses who were part of the vigilante group. To summarize these confessions, it appears that the intention was to take Louis from York's place back to Watcom to stand trial for Bell's murder, as they had no confidence that the British would properly recognize American concerns, which is a, in contrast to what the Canadians believed. However, the leaders who have been stated as Bill Moultrie, identified by Louis Sam, or Bert Hopkins, which is identified by Pete Hopkins, got, or Pete Harkness, Bert Hopkins and Pete Harkness. They got into an argument with the others about avoiding the extra time and expense of a trial by taking justice into their own hands. As they disputed this, they passed under a cedar tree that had uprooted 
and uh, rested on a big stump on the other side. So it formed an archway over the trail under, under which they had to ride. And the leaders thought it was in Washington territory, so they decided it was a convenient place to end it all. The next day, Thursday the 28th, Deputy Steele went to Campbell's house to report that Louis had been taken captive and they returned to, and then Steele returned to his home across the border. Campbell took two local Indians, who were Chilliwacks, with him and went south in the trail to see if they could find Louis. They found him hanging from an, the uprooted cedar and the Indians held Louis up while Campbell cut him down. Campbell determined he was dead and gave the body to Big Charlie and Jim York, the two Indians, for safekeeping and told them that someone would want to uh, come and examine the body. Now cor Coroner Charles Todd held an inquest that began on Saturday, March 1st, which would be the next day. After he completed his examination, the inquest is well documented. There is no doubt that Louis Sam died by hanging from that cedar tree and it was the vigilantes, which, who were assumed to be American, who hung him there. Now on the other side of the border, a different death was being considered. At the time of his murder, Jim Bell was living alone as his wife was in New Westminster teaching school and had, had young Jim with her. Jim Bell Sr. had a habit, habit of feeding people who walked the trail and often sold small items to them from his store. His probate lists all the personal possessions, and it is evident by for me anyway, he did not have enough qu to qualify for what we now call a store. Jim and his wife Annette and young Jim had come to the crossing in 78, took the homestead just east of the crossing and constructed the two-room log cabin. It was located just west of the future Nooksack campground with a, within a stone's throw of the later constructed tabernacle. Bell had proven up on his homestead and was ready to receive his patent. The two rooms of the cabin were evidently a small bedroom and a larger living space. Jim had later constructed a lean-to on one side and made it into a kitchen. Evidence Coroner Manley, Manley found, this is the American coroner, seemed to indicate that Bell was facing the lean-to and preparing a meal when he was shot in the head from behind. He fell backward into the living space and died there. The complete coroner's port report has been lost to history but the summary in local papers has been uh, well preserved. The summary is the best factual data available reporting Jim Bell's murder. Nobody from the Canadian side ever saw Jim Bell's dead body or the site of the murder before all evidence was destroyed. The arrest made after Jim's body was interred, the arrest w of Louis was made after Jim Bell's body was interred in the Nooksack Cemetery, or where the Nooksack Cemetery exists now. Cemetery didn't come into existence until two years later. 86 is when my great-grandfather created that Nooksack Cemetery. So I read you that uh, Now I want to read you uh, two of the confessions that were uh, reported in Nooksack Tales and Trails. Let's see, I don't think I need any more there. The first one was George Gillis. He was one of the three that uh, found uh, the body. He was one of the three Gillies boys that found the body. It says, we, we are indebted to the late, this is uh, uh, Jeffcott is writing this story in his book. And it says, we are indebted to the late Mr. George Gillis for these details. Uh, my father said, Mr. Gillis, which was George, had settled on Sumas Creek where he and his wee boys built a dam and started a small grist mill. Those of you who uh, know the trail, well, we're not on that map. Uh, where the Gillies Road runs into the Lindsay Road, that's where the uh, Gillies ma uh, Mill was up on, on there. And it was the biggest mi lumber mill in the area. And it had a big dam uh, on the Sumas Creek south of there and another little dam uh, where Ostrom's place is. That, uh, the Ostrom place w was uh, supplied the water to run their wheel, water wheel. And now, let's see. Just, uh, the, we boys built a dam and started a gr small grist mill. The first mill was a grist mill, then they built the lumber mill. That's to grind the grain. 
the first in that part of the country. Being religiously inclined, we walked the four miles on sun to Sunday school at the crossing and back every Sunday and past Mr. Bell's cabin going and coming. Returning from the cro crossing one Sunday, early in 84, we, as we approached the cabin, we noticed heavy smoke rising from the roof. Hurrying forward, we found the cabin in flames, and on the floor of the kitchen lean-to, at the back lay the body of Mr. Bell. We were able, to, with difficulty, to drag the body from the room before the fire reached it, and discovered a large bullet hole in the back of his head. We were unable to save any of the stock or goods. By this time, other neighbors arrived, and after considerable discussion, we came to the conclusion that Mr. Bell had been shot from behind as he passed from the storeroom to the kitchen by whom, of course, we did not know. We decided to search the premises, and after going over a large part of the clearing, found faint tracks headed toward the nearby swamp. The trail led to a large log which projected out into the swamp and there ended. We climbed under the log and continued out on it into the swale and found where someone had made a long jump from the log into the marsh and headed westward. Returning to the remains of the cab cabin, we held a consultation in an effort to establish some clue as to the identity of the murderer. Naturally, under the stress of this excitement, it was some time before we could formulate any definite conclusions. But the fact that uh, the renegade Indian known as uh, Mean Sam, Mean Jack Sam, who divided his time between British Columbia and the crossing, was reported to have been seen that day in the neighborhood with a rifle, causing us to suspect him as the perpetrator of the murder. After arranging for the care of the body of Mr. Bell, a posse was organized to follow the trail of the probable slayer that led off into the swamp. They did not proceed far before they found conclusive evidence that they were on the track of the guilty party. First a handkerchief was found dangling from a limb of a tree, and then a little further on they came to a pair of suspenders that had been snatched from the fugitive by the brush as he b hastened toward the dense growth through the dense growth. Robbery was plainly the incentive of the crime, and judging by the number of above items lost in his flight, his desire seemed to have been satisfied with the booty at, of that nature, as no money was taken from the victim. Due to the approaching dark, darkness, the posse was unable to pursue further that day, but the whole district was thoroughly aroused with threats of quick justice, were, uh, with wild threats of quick justice were repeated often. So that was uh, what happened uh, with the posse at the murder site. Now we re uh, return. We go back to Pete Harkness, who was on a trail uh, two or three miles away from the site and coming home. He said, I met uh, Massachi Jack Sam and Mr. Harkness, said Mr. Harkness, in telling this part of the story. He was on the road midway between Linden and the crossing. I was alone, and the look on the Indian's face as he approached me struck me with horror. I moved to the far side of the road in passing him and then hurried home as fast as I could go, where I learned of the murder from my mother. Message Jack Sam fled to the Linden district where he hid in the Indian camp for that night. But on being told by his telecom, gee, that was an Indian chief, that the whites were after him, he fled before dawn, and circling back through the timber, escaped into British Columbia, where his father, known as Mestici Mean Sam, lived, but who at this time was in jail in New Westminster under charge of murder. By this time, Sheriff Lecky of Whatcom had taken charge of the manhunt for Mestici Jack Sam and learned of his escape into British Columbia. He proceeded across the line where, with the aid of two constables, he located the Indian near Sumas Lake. Here's where he, it doesn't have it right, because there were two days between the time they quit looking for him in Linden before he went across the border. He, it was on Monday that they went looking for him in Linden. It was Wednesday before they went, acro or before they went across the border and arrested him. So Pete got that wrong. But he was only 15 at the time, so we have to give him a little slack. Uh, unable to return his prisoner to the American side without proper legal procedures, Sheriff Lecky left Master Chief Jack Sam in charge of two constables at the home of Thomas York 
on the Sumas Prairie. Meanwhile, the shock and highly incensed neighbors of the slain man had arranged for his funeral, which was largely attended. It was held in the cabin of one of the settlers named Hauser. Uh, if you want to know where Hauser's homestead is, it is now called the city of Nooksack. The railroad company bought out Hauser and, and platted the, the town of Nooksack on the Hauser homestead. So all of the town of Nooksack is all of Hauser's 120-acre homestead. So uh, that was it. Uh, incidentally, there was it was known that the uh, people at the funeral came from as far away as Linden and Ten Mile. So they, they, they think there may have been as many as 200 uh, uh, people there at the funeral. So uh, now, then, then we'll, we'll move two more days then from when he saw him on the road to the funeral. At the funeral, uh, they had all these people. And then Pete goes on saying, I rode my pony to the funeral, continued Mr. Harkness. The funeral over, there was much continued discussion of the events of the past few days, and now and then a suggestion that the murderer ought to be hanged. I noticed a group of men off to one side who seemed most engrossed, more engrossed in the discussion than the others. It was made up of the more prominent settlers, among whom I saw Bill Moultrie, my brother Alan Harkness, W.D. Van Buren, Jim Scott, who ran Scott and Hart, um, and William Gillis, which is the brother of George, one of the boys, uh, and Bert Hopkins. Soon they seemed to come to some understanding, for they mounted their horses and, followed by many others on foot, set out to the north over the telegraph road by Bert Hopkins, who was assumed the leadership. Uh, these facts are important because there were various people who reported different people leading the group. But Pete was there, he saw it, and he said what he saw. And he was only a kid, so why would he lie? It says, one of the, uh, out of boyish curiosity, I followed them on my pony. Isn't that what a little boy would do? Where are these guys going? I'm going to go follow them. And as they paid no attention to me or my presence, I continued to trail them. About midway between the crossing and Sumas Prairie, where the district of Gera is located, later developed, uh, it, we know it as Damtown, uh, the vigilantes, for such they proved to be, met Sheriff Lick Lecky, which coincides with everything else that's been said. And he was returning on horseback from pursuit of Message Jack Sam in British Columbia. Evidently sensing from their appearance the mission of the party and not caring to assume any responsibility for their actions, the sheriff merely remarked, How do you do, boys? You'll find him up there all right. And rode on south on his way to Whatcom, where judging from his actions, that official had urgent matters demanding his attention. Riding on, we reached and crossed the border into British Columbia. After going on a mile or so, the vigilante stopped and instructed me and William Gallick Gillies to go no further, as they did not want any boys mixed up in what they proposed to do. We were disappointed, but said nothing while the leader, Bert Hopkins, gave last instructions and told all to disguise themselves by tying handkerchiefs over their faces. This is direct contradiction of other information that was told by Canadians. Uh, so we remained there, and we built a fire to keep warm which was later reported in the Canadian reports that there was a fire there, and awaited their return. But to say that we were uneasy at being left alone is putting it very lightly. Can you imagine two little boys in the wilds of Canada <laughs> on the only trail, all by themselves in the dark with a little fire? In fact, we were fearful of what might happen and darkness having come on did not lessen our apprehension. So uh, that was then. Pete goes on then later says, after a long wait, uh, Mr. Harkness continued, we heard horses approaching in the darkness from the north and soon the posse appeared in the moonlight 
with the Indian mounted on a pony led by one of the vigilantes. Message Jack was remonstrated that one of his shoes was coming off, and he wanted the leader to stop so he could fasten it, and the leader of the pony refused, whereas the Indian exclaimed angrily, Me get out this, me fix you, you Moultrie. Recognized the leader of the horse by his voice, which also contradicts other information. Coming up where they left us waiting, the men stopped for consultation. Being confused in the darkness, they supposed they were in the United States and did not discover their mistake until much later. Suddenly they were filled with alarm by sounds coming from back up the trail. Fearing pursuit by the British Columbia Indians, they hastily drew aside into the brush by the road. You can imagine they could disappear in that brush. It would only take about 10 feet and they would all be gone. There would be no vision, no sight of them any place. But uh, no one appeared, so one of the more venturesome of the party, Bert Hopkins, rode back up a short distance and soon returned, returning that there was no danger from that source. Then the vigilante, somewhat nervous from their scare, discussed the fate of the pr prisoner. Some favored him returning to the crossing, while others were disposed were for disposing of the Indian at once. The arguments of the latter prevailed, and a tree that leaned well over the road at a convenient height offered opportunity for quick action. With a rope was being thrown over the projecting tree, the horse with a luckless driver was led beneath it and the noose tightened around the murderer's neck. At a word from the leader, Bert Hopkins, the horse was driven out from under, leaving uh, Messachie Jack Sam suspended in midair. During all the preparations, the doomed man made no protest by either word or action and went to his death without a struggle. That's an important quote because it's in opposed to what other people have said. Leaving the body hanging as a warning to other potential criminals, the vigilantes rode away, just crossed the line, and quickly dispersed. And we hear no more of any individual vigilantes for 60 years. They uh, sent some deputies down, and uh, that we'll, we'll go into that a little later. Now, now are there any questions? Kathy. A little louder, Kathy. 60 years after the fact is when that testimony It was 46, I think. 46 from 64, that'd be 62 years to be exact. Okay, because that's why I was wondering, I didn't realize there was that big gap. I was wondering if that concise of a testimony was given why no one was accused of anything. So that's of the Jalonsi party. Excuse me, let me repeat her question. She wanted to know whether that was 60 years from the actual uh, murder or uh, what, and it was because these people were extremely frightened. They're, not only were the Americans, uh, Canadians looking for them, but so were the Americans, because by that time the government had gotten involved and they said they were going to uh, make bad trouble for anybody they found, but they never found anybody, because everybody kept their mouth shut, except for a couple of gossiping ladies who talked to the detectives, and we'll hear about those in, the, in this next story. Going on now, we'll, t we'll take the actual story that was written by uh, Dr. Carlson, which was by far the best researched, and he has all the footnotes that enabled me to be able to read 190 Canadian documents, that, uh, or pages of Canadian documents, that helped me understand what the Canadians were thinking and why he wrote the way he did. Uh, one of the difficulties uh, that I have is that he apparently took the side of his employer, which is the Canadian Indian tribe. Uh, but anyhow, the, uh, I'll try and go through this quickly, So, and, but we'll have time for que questions afterwards, hopefully. It says, uh, one of the things that he says, uh, the, he starts out by saying his oppositions. He says, it is doubtful that many of the American, American settlers who participated in or condoned the lynching of Louis Sam regarded Northern Washington ter Territory in 1884 as a particularly dangerous frontier where criminals were beyond the reach of legitimate law enforcement agencies. Now that's, in my opinion, totally false because my grandpa said that there was a great deal of fear about justice in the, on the frontier in 1884. And my grandpa lived here, Dor Carlson didn't. 
So it said, indeed, young Louis was incarcerated by Canadian officials within 24 hours of the murder of Nooksack shopkeeper. It was three days. It wasn't 24 hours. And he wasn't arrested until the Americans went up there and told him what was they needed to have him arrested. The records uh, documented the lynching suggest that the crime actually was committed by an American settler from Nooksack who used Louis as a scapegoat. That's the Canadian Indian side of the story. The Canadian uh, uh, courts threatened to expose the scheme and in response the American organized a new lynching. The lynching was organized, completed, before the Canadian courts even found out about it. So they could not have organized it after the scheme was uh, And the courts didn't uh, attempt to pr pr expose this scheme. They tended to, be, they took a brunt, uh, front because we had lynched a Canadian. Now, it says, initially Canadian Indians were more concerned with the implications of violating their territorial sovereignty than they were the murder of an Indian boy, which is very true. However, when Indian Antone's wife, a Chilliwack, was dug up from the, from the Nooksack Cemetery and transported back to Canada and buried in Indian style north of the line, the Canadians weren't at all interested. They didn't think that was a bad problem at all, which to me are, were similar violations of national sovereignty. Okay, let's see. There, it's also said there was reported by that there was $500 in gold in the Bell home. And uh, if his total estate was worth $613, I doubt when he died, I doubt if he had $500 in gold someplace. That, uh, but they think that uh, that was the reason for the murder. Peter Harkness reported seeing an adolescent Canadian Indian named Louis Sam traveling back along the Wat Whatcom Trail towards what is now Abbotsford, B.C. That's not true. He was traveling west on the Linden Trail towards Linden. He was not going back to Canada. He was going to Linden. So that's not true. Said the circumstantial evidence that all that was, this circumstantial evidence was all that was needed to convince the Nooksack settlers of Louis' guilt. The, the settlers believed Louis was guilty because the coroner's jury said so. They had re reached a verdict that this Louis Sam had committed murder. And that's the reason they got upset. After surveying the scene, the Whatcom County Sheriff traveled to B.C. and reported the murder and situation about Louis Salmon to William Campbell. That's not true. It took three days. It was after the funeral, three days later, that uh, he went. And then by that time, he had a jury verdict that he went up with. Meanwhile, during the funeral ceremony for James Bell, approximately 100 men led by William Osterman, Rockton Breckridge, Bill Moultrie, and Bert Hopkins decided to take matters into their own hands. There's no evidence that Osterman or Breckridge were ever with the posses. Nobody has said that any place but except the Canadian Indians. Matter of fact, Robert Breckenridge said in a do another document that he never went with them. So that's uh, that. They quote some. Uh, they quote that from Jeffcott, which is not true. Yeah, no. The mob leaders uh, sent a scout posing, posing at a traveler ahead of them to the farm. Well, there was a traveler at the farm. But he was at the farm before the posse was formed because he was a guest at the hotel. Now, whether he was sent up there by the pe people from Linden who knew that York had Louis or not, I don't know that. But uh, there's no evidence that, uh, that the, it, the mob leaders could not have sent that scout and had him there in time. And it said, later that night, after everyone had gone to sleep, this man, man the man, that they said sent, were sent up there, managed to get inside the farmhouse. He didn't manage to get inside the farmhouse. He was in there as a guest. He was a paying guest. And he unbolted the front door. But York himself said in his own testimony that Steele may have unbolted the door. Nobody ever implicated the stranger except uh, the, right here. Uh, Constable Steele seems to have been disarmed before young, before York confronted the vigilantes, and uh, the uh, inquest remarks said Steele still was armed, but did not use his gun. And uh, it said he may have unlocked the door, and it said he still had his gun, he just didn't use it. Well, if you had 
20 people in your house with a gun, you probably don't want to use your gun either. It might be dangerous. Uh, it says, uh, he goes on to say, based on, he read the same article I did and you heard, and he said that they tied his feet firmly together and slung one end of the rope around his neck. Well, that may or may not be true. He said the other end was tossed over a branch of a giant cedar and secured to a second to smaller tree across the trail. There's nothing that I've ever read that comes even close to saying that. They said he, he was hung from a down cedar. And it said the mob taunted, well, that's not it. That's another one. Louis was able to see past the disguise of the man leading the horse, and he boldly addressed his captor by name, proclaiming, we get you out of this, me fix you, Bill Moultrie. Well, Bill was never in the quote that Harkness said, and uh, uh, he said he was recogn recognized him by his voice. It was dark. It was pitch dark. They, no way they could, and they could see past the disguise, not true. It said, it, and Bill Moultrie, shocked at his uh, identification, slapped uh, Louis's horse, causing the, uh, the, the rope tighten and the young boy's neck to pull taut. After several long minutes of struggling, Louis died. Well, now the evidence shows that uh, Hopkins uh, commanded the horse to be driven out. He, and as far as we know, that there was no slapping of the horse. And as far as we know, Moultrie was not surprised at the identification or anything like that. And uh, uh, Pete Harkness said that he died without a struggle. So whether, I don't know where they, I guess it made better sense to write if they, he was struggling. Now, uh, the reputation of this, uh, this boy that they hung, which uh, I think Penny Lett is the one that says they hung the wrong man. They hung an innocent 14-year-old Indian lad by a lynch mob from America. Well, I'm going to read you what some of the Canadian papers said about this innocent 14-year-old. Uh, On the 1st of uh, March, this was the day the, uh, the uh, coroner, Canadian coroner, started his jury, Sam and his relatives are a bad lot, and there will be few regrets wasted upon the suddenness of his exit. Uh, four days later, the same paper, the British Columbian, said, Mr. Moresby, who was the constable, thinks there is very little doubt but that the Indian was guilty. He had a knife said to be belong to the murdered man. Possibly uh, that would indicate something. And uh, the 12th, uh, a week later, they said the Indian was suspected of killing, uh, he was suspected of killing before and is no, a known thief in the New Westminster district. And on the 19th, a week, another week later, the story told by the Indians at Chilliwack, published in the last issue of the Columbian, may or may not be true. It is an improbable story, and we are inclined to doubt. And the Mainland Guardian, another uh, paper, said uh, Superintendent Todd, Todd, who was also the coroner, Coroner Charles Todd, said the Indian was such a bad character that it is exceedingly difficult to obtain any evidence against those who have put him out of the way. And uh, uh, three days later they said, he was notably a bad character, suspected of many crimes, and they had every reasonable round, grounds for believing him to be the murderer. That's what the Canadian paper said about this, none of which is reported in the uh, Canadian stories. It says, now this is, this is what I think Dr. Carlson believed. According to the Indian version of what happened, as recorded by McTierman in a local newspaper, Osterman orchestrated events to shield his own guilt and to direct suspicion towards Louis. The American telegraph operator was invited, had invited the young Indian to travel with him along the Whatcom Trail toward Bell's home at the pre pretext of employing him to repair the telegraph line. Then just as they approached the shopkeeper's establishment, the telegraph operator pretended to have changed his mind and told Louis to go away, which he did. Nobody saw Louis 
with Osterman on the trail before the event. Uh, there was, and as my, I would seriously doubt that uh, a thing like helping him on the telegraph line would be something they would in, in, uh, hire a person of that character. It says, Osterman apparently then murdered Bell and quickly rode away from the scene of the crime, correctly assuming that others would see Louis near Bell's store both before and after the incident and draw the obvious conclusions. The three uh, Gillies boys were walking along that same trail and would have passed Osterman, and if they had been riding his horse quickly, I'm sure they would have noted that uh, he was in a hurry. But... Uh, it says in the ver uh, Indian version of the events is correct, then Osterman no doubt assumed that Louis would be quickly arrested and summarily brought, uh, composed of a jury consisting of Bell's neighbor. This plot would have see see succeeded had Louis not discovered that people were looking for him. So informed, he headed south before doubling back through the forest to rejoin the Whatcom Trail. Not true. South was the river. He headed north. He never tried to cross the river. And uh, anyway. It's another interesting footnote here that at 10.30 on the night of the murder, a telegraph message arrived from Nooksack stating that a man traveling from Canada had met up with a group of vigilantes near the border. My guess that would be Sheriff Leckie. And he came back, he got to the crossing, and he told the telegraph operator, who happened to be Mr. Osterman, that there were people, and the telegraph warned that these men were probably going after Louis Sam. Given that Osterman was the local telegraph operator, it's unclear why or how such a message was transmitted. Uh, Osterman only taught one other person how to operate the uh, telegraph, as far as we know, and that was Pete Harkness. And we know where Pete Harkness was, and he wasn't at the telegraph key. So they, it evidently Osterman transmitted that message at 10.30, which means he couldn't have been with the posse. But... Uh, that's, the, uh, okay, now, this is the one that, uh, Teresa, you'll love this, no, you won't love this, you'll not like this. These were the, uh, three detectives, and, uh, they came down, and their, their reports are all, all of their visits and their words are reported, and it said, Mr. Clark, the first, uh, then came down, he determined the identity of a number of the lynchers. At that time, they were still, they, uh, didn't know ever they weren't quite as quiet about it as they were later on and people were still talking about it and there were people that knew who some of the people were and they were talking about it and they were mentioning names and all the while Whatcom County newspapers confirmed that the Nooksack residents were itching for a chance to clean out the entire band of murdering thieving residents well some of them were my family and I didn't know I never have heard that they were trying to do that but that's what, and the fourth estate warns that if the Stolo attempted to gain redress for the international lawlessness of the vigilantes, then Her Majesty might be minus a few dusty uh, subjects, which was true because there were many people in Seattle who were ready to take up arms and come up and, and do mayhem, and the Indians were really interested in coming down and wiping out a lot of, in, uh, of the settlers. It says, now the next the next guy, this is the guy that came, uh, the Nooksack residents uh, found, uh, told Mr. Clark that he might get a disease affecting the throat that he might not recover from if he continued to talk to the people in the, in the yard. So he left. And he sent Charles Russell down. And Charles Russell said, uh, uh, came down, and he, but he went, another right, he went to York's place first. And he found that York had suddenly taken an extended vacation to Seattle. And apparently because his life had been threatened by the Indians. <laughs> nice to get back in the United States, huh? Uh, and so he found out what trip he was, boat he was going to be on. So he boarded the boat and he became buddy-buddy with him all the way to Seattle. And he said one of the reasons we followed him to Seattle was he spent a couple of days waiting for an opportunity to get him drunk and to work him. But York kept close to his wife and denied him the chance to ever work him, or get him drunk either. And discouraged by his lack of success, Russell returned to Nooksack and re learned that there were many, there were other American settlers who had stronger motives and more opportunities to kill Jim Bell than did Louis Sam. Very interesting. 
Apparently, James Bell and his wife, Annette, were estranged. And for nearly a year, the latter had been living with and appears to be married to none other than the mob ringleader, David Harkness. Well, as far as we know, David Harkness was never even with the mob. And he was the father of the boy who claimed to be seen, who have seen Louis sneaking back to Sumath. Well, he was sneaking to Linden to start with, and the boy who saw him was David Harkness's brother, not his boy. Apparently, Bell had never accepted that he, what he considered to be his wife's adultery, and he had never recently quarreled with Harkness. Local gossip, this is where it is, Mrs. Breckenridge and Mrs. Eddy were the lo two local gossips that talked to Russell. Local gossip maintained that Bell was making arrangements to take Harkness and his new bride to court over the fair. You've got to remember that she did not marry uh, David Harkness until two months after the uh, murder. So uh, the fact that they were his, he, she wasn't a new bride, that's for sure. Uh, that David then was determined to stand up to Bell, and he mustered the support of his influential family, and uh, Harkness' his sister uh, was married to the telegraph opera William Osterman, which is true. The fellow uh, from the Indian tribe considered guilty of the murder. Osterman had sided with his brother-in-law against Bell and, as mentioned, was known to be the last person to have seen him alive. In fact, he was seen galloping away from Bell's house only minutes before the fire and the murder was detected. Uh, I don't know where it gets at because I haven't seen the evidence. A number of Osterman's neighbors shared the Indian's view that he had killed James Bell. Uh, there's a couple of gossips that did. And if the Stolo supplied an explanation of how Osterman murdered Bell and framed Louie, the results of Detective Clark's investigation provided a motive. Aside from a wanting to protect his brother-in-law from the expense and scandal of a legal battle, Osterman and his family stood to benefit financially from Bell's death. Assuming he died before he could legally prove Annette's, Annette's infidelity. Bell died in intestate and all of his wealth went to his his and Annette's 10 year old son, James Jr. Now, isn't that sad? Went logically to the next heir. It did not take long for Annette to become legal guardian of young Jimmy. I don't know what she was before that. <laughs> yeah, she was his mother, so I think don't mothers usually have guard, take, aren't they usually guardian of their children? Anyhow, uh, young, she took guardian of young Jimmy and therefore gained full control over her murdered husband's assets. The entire process was expedited by James Harkness, David's father, who was appointed executor of Bell Estate. Adding further intrigue, James Harkness uh, secured his son-in-law, William Osterman, as appraiser for the Bell Estate. Oh, very close fun. And after estimating the value of Bell's assets as $613.84, the Harkness clan immediately auctioned it off. Significantly, the fees of the two men uh, uh, who drew f for their work on the Bell Estates consumed nearly half of the total value. The remainder went to Annette. Can you imagine that? Went to his wife. Oh. After receiving their share, David and Annette used their newfound wealth to establish a dry goods store, thereby taking advantage of the void created by the sudden closing of James Bell's establishment. I never knew where James or David and Nadette's establishment was ever built. I had never heard about it because, as I was telling Teresa, as far as I know, David was ill at the time of Bird's Bell's murder and may very well have married Jeanette to give her a place to live. And because he died six months later of natural causes. And... Uh, but by then she had taken over the ferry and was in business for herself. And she's a very, also she was postmistress, postmistress at the uh, crossing post office. Anyway, I personally see a lot of potential for a difference of opinion from previously published reports. And with that, I'll ask for questions. <laughs> I stunned you with all that, huh? Yes, sir. Well, with all of your research that you did on, on the topic, was there a certain area that really stymied you where you, you just met a brick wall and you couldn't, get, couldn't find any more information on it? 
Uh, no, because uh, I believe it's pretty well documented as far as people went. Uh, 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 as we were talking before, they were very quiet on the American side, and shortly after the murder, all stop, all talking stopped for a generation at least. And by that time, the Americans weren't any longer interested, and they could start letting people know. Although none of them, I don't sense that any of them were ever proud of what happened. They weren't happy with what happened. They were uh, remiss that it didn't turn out like they wanted to, where they brought him back to the United States and he, he was tried and, and found guilty in an American court. And then he was hung, because both Americans and the uh, Canadians were hanging their, their murderers. So the fact that he was hung, it was just the wrong timing if he was really guilty. Yes? So there wasn't any way to definitely ascertain where the border was? It sounds like people just sort of slipped across the there border. Was, there was an iron bolt or an iron marker in the ground at the border. But this was night, and this was woods, and nobody stopped to find out where the iron bolt was. They just assumed, if you're going you, they'd come about two miles from York's place, and it was a, probably another mile to the nearest settler. So in that three miles, they probably figured they had gone far enough to be in the United States and felt that tree was in the United States, and they were only 500 feet off. Do you think, so. you think if they'd been in the United States and did the same thing in the United States, there would have been the if same If they would have been in the United States, the Canadian government wouldn't have had much jurisdiction. But what, would, what do you think the... Can you project at all what you think the United States response would have been to the lynching? Excuse me? Can you project at all what the United States response might have been? The United States response was primarily to satisfy the Canadians. No, but I mean, if it happened on the United States side. If it happened on the United States side, they probably would have gone looking, but they wouldn't have been near as concerned as the Canadians were. The Canadians were the ones that had the most concern about the event. The Americans got concerned whenever they found Americans were involved, but uh, at least they thought they were involved. But nobody ever was able to prove that any American was ever up there. You know, I think it's interesting to note too that Bert actually was sent away after this happened to go to school right. in Perth, where the Simpson family had relatives. And because that's where they originated from after they left Scotland. They, they settled on the Scotch Line in Perth, Ontario. But it's interesting that they sent him away to go to school because of some of the issues that developed after this occurred. There was a lot of, I think, um, unsettling going on around that nobody wanted to talk about this. And they certainly didn't want his life to be impacted by any negative feelings about what happened. Yeah, I. Tracy, I think your the the question was uh, the intrigue and all that, and and, and young Bert, young Jim, was sent away to uh, the school uh, to get him out of the milieu because, as the detectives found out, there were some people at the crossing who didn't like Annette or Jim, and there were other people who had very interesting stories to tell. Now, whose axe was being whose ox was being gored? I don't understand that all that intrigue. But uh, we, most of them were so busy on their homesteads trying to prove up that they didn't have time for all the other intrigue that uh, other people had. Other questions? Well, I have, I have one. <laughs> I, have, I have others. I'll be visiting with you again on this topic in July. But the thing that, that interests me is that Simpson was part of that vigilante group also. And he married Annette after Harkness. Mm -hmm. So you have this very interesting situation <laughs> where this woman is the pivotal part of this whole issue that never really got taken care of because all the focus was one, you know, placed on the actual occurrence of lynching this, this young man. But there was a whole other story that took place after that in terms of how it impacted everybody who was still at Emerson. And that yeah, it's... Uh Jim, the the thing that I was I felt responsible for is Jim's felt or Bert felt that his dad's story had never been told, mm -hmm. and he felt that was 
a travesty of justice that his dad had died and been murdered and nobody ever really worried much about it. Nobody ever investigated it. Nobody tried to find out that. And it all the attention moved over to uh, the lynching of Louis Sam, which was not a good thing. It was a bad thing. But uh, there was a bad thing happened at Nooksack Crossing, too. A very kindly older man, 59, uh, was killed. Because he didn't even have a gun. He just killed and shot in the back of the head uh, for no apparent reason. And uh, so, anyway. Did Bird ever talk about Harkness? About or, did Bird ever talk about Harkness or Simpson? About what? Harkness or Simpson did. I never, never asked him about them. He just no. never talked about no, those two he individuals. Never. He, uh, Bird had no animosity against anyone that I know of. He was a very, very, for, of course, he was 90 when I knew him, but uh, he was very forgiving. He told me lots of stories that happened that uh, I loved. I'm so glad to talk to him because I talked to somebody that was uh, the first postmaster in Nooksack or in Everson simply because he could type. <laughs> he was the first person in the area that could type. You know, and now people don't even know what a typewriter is. <laughs> so... That we go back that far, but uh, he was a he, but you, and that was a very strong woman, and uh, as most of the women on the frontier were, but uh, it, uh, I felt some of the information that's out there that has been out there for 130 years needs to be said, may not like the the Colombian said, may not be true. But it's the Indian story, and it's held for all these years, and they've passed it down through oral tradition. The thing that bothers me most is not a single one of those Indians ever saw all the evidence they said pointed to the guilt of Osterman. They talked about the shod horse prints around the cabin because uh, Osterman's horse had shoes on it, but no, most horses did not. And so, therefore, that proved that he was around the cabin guilty. Well, there were no horse prints around the, ca around the cabin. And there were many things they said, or several things they said about what happened that they couldn't have known because they, they were in, it happened in the United States and none of them were here. They would have had to talk to somebody or had a hearsay of some kind. Now, yes, Kathy. I'm still interested in Annette. So did anybody really interview her about her version of events? Well, we'll let Teresa talk about Annette in, <laughs> in July. Annette was a, a, a very interesting woman, and I don't, there, there's not a whole lot told about her because you've got to remember, we were a male society in 1884, not a female society. So women didn't count for much, even though she was, became one of the most influential people in Everson. Uh, she was not talked about much, at least not that I have found out. Of course, I haven't researched, haven't talked in depth to the Thompson family, so I don't know uh, One thing a lot I of will stuff. tell you, having looked at the pictures, she was quite an attractive woman in her day. Yes. And as she aged, she stayed very attractive. And Simpson was a very attractive man, and I think they, they made an a interesting couple in their later years. In terms they were of very history. prominent, yes. I'm through.